Yeah, so you know this, this is sort of a barter economy, and it gets in. I mean, that relates to the you know, financial issues. There isn't much penetration of even cash, let alone any formal financial sector. You your hand up. There we go. Water as well. Okay, one more. Yeah. Oh, two more. How about both of you guys? That's right. So that, that's a good catch. So that was food aid, which she uses to sort of sew her daughter's um, dress. She uses like a thread from the food aid bag. They kind of at some point have received food aid in not too distant past. Yep. That's right. So there's there's an issue of technology adoption in agriculture, which seems really salient. You know, you might have much higher yield if you could use fertilizer and improved seeds and some mechanization, etc. But they don't have access to any of that. And you know, it makes a bunch of these different issues start you thinking about things like poverty traps. If only they could get that equipment, they could be much more productive and be a lot richer. If only they could be healthier, they could be a lot more productive and richer. So we're gonna come back to some of those themes uh, in the course. So you guys picked up on a lot of them. <coughs> and again, it's um. You know, the next time any of us complain about having to get out of bed for an early class, you know, think about you know this this case uh, of this woman. And you know, there are hundreds of millions of people just like her in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there's a lot more people living lives uh, like this woman in Eritrea than our lives in uh, in the U.S. Okay, so let's now um, let's talk about numbers and statistics. You know, so we hopefully saw a concrete example of a real life and what poverty looks like in real life. But there's still going to be value to putting together the data, um, and that's what we're going to do next. Unless there's any, la any last comments or thoughts on that example. Okay, so data. What are we looking at? This is something from your syllabus. It's the first entry on the first week. It's from the United Nations uh, Development Program, UNDP, Human Development Report. And what they do every year is they put together statistics on a number of different development indicators. And in particular, in their main index, they focus on three numbers. They focus on life expectancy, they focus on schooling, and they focus on per capita income. And they combine those into an index, which gives a rough sense of the quality of life in countries around the world. The idea being, having income is good, because you can buy stuff with income. But you know, even beyond income alone, health and education are really critical components of a um, a desirable life, a life we'd all like, like to lead. And what we have here is the major developing regions and middle-income regions of the world. So actually, here there are six. There are the four we had before, plus the Arab states, which are basically Mid-East and North Africa, not exactly, but, but mostly. And there's also Europe and Central Asia. This is really the former Soviet bloc and Eastern Europe, which are poorer than Western Europe. So the only countries really excluded here are Western European countries, um, some North American countries, a couple of rich East Asian countries like Japan, um, what are called the OECD countries. But this is the vast majority of the world population here. And um, but what patterns do you guys see? I've obviously bracketed Sub-Saharan Africa. Can you guys make out the font, or is it a little too, it's kind of like an eye test a little bit back there? If you can see this, you know, like it's 2010 vision. I don't know. Um, so what, what do you see in this, in this box? Or where does Africa stand relative to the rest of the world on these measures? Should I turn off the uh, light, maybe? Does that make it? No. Is it on the other side? OK. Let's see. Ah. Can you guys see it now? OK, good. Yeah. Good question. OK. Mean years of schooling, the way the UNDP puts it together, is average years of schooling for adults 25 and above in that country. So that really tells you about past educational investments and tells you about the sort of educational uh, characteristics of the current workforce, basically. Expected years of schooling looks at current enrollment among kids in school age and says, if these exact trends continue going forward, how much education basically will the next generation have? That's the way to think about it. So what are some patterns you see, you see here? Yeah. Right, so in, in terms of mean years of schooling, South Asia is really bad, too. You know, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, on average, have really bad schooling measures, um, very similar to Sub-Saharan Africa. On the other measures, Sub-Saharan Africa is doing worse. For instance, on, on life expectancy. Does anybody have a view on why life expectancy is so much lower in Sub-Saharan Africa than other regions? Yeah. Yeah, so HIV-AIDS is a big part of it. Life expectancy in Sub-Saharan Africa actually fell a lot in the 1990s and into the 2000s because of HIV-AIDS. Uh, but even beyond that, there's malaria, there's other tropical disease. But there's a big gap. I mean, there's a gap of more than 10 years in life expectancy between the next uh, poorest regions. Yeah. Civil wars are another part of it, which we will also talk about. Um, three quarters of African countries have had at least one year of civil war since 1980. So civil war is extremely widespread in Sub-Saharan Africa, and often there's a lot of civilian casualties. Yeah. Neonatal death is another, another part of it, and we'll talk about some of those trends as well. That's right, so there's a lot of, of different explanations. Yeah. Right, so if you're poor and you don't eat well, you're prone to a whole range of diseases that, that would then shorten the lifespan. So, so there's a whole bunch of reasons which we'll talk about. We see Sub-Saharan Africa is doing poorly here, doing better here. So there's some positive trends, and we'll talk about some of the very positive trends probably more on Thursday, but you see there's been this big jump up in schooling. Current generations are getting a lot more schooling in Africa than past generations, twice as much. And that holds also in South Asia and other regions. Everywhere, schooling levels are increasing over time, and they're very dramatic in Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's a sign of a turnaround. We'll talk more about signs of a turnaround. <coughs> Sorry. This is economist summary number, though, per capita income. And this is per capita income, and it's, it's important to emphasize in what's called PPP terms, purchasing power parity. Now, what does PPP mean? PPP means we're doing the best we can to adjust for the fact that things cost different amounts in different countries. In other words, prices are different. So anybody who's traveled in other countries will be shocked to say, well, you know, I went to Oslo, and my Coke in the airport cost $12. Prices are just much higher in Oslo than they are in Berkeley. Right, Jonas? Maybe ten dollars. Maybe ten dollars. Okay. Um, in contrast, if you go to rural Kenya, you can get a meal, pretty good meal, for forty cents or thirty cents. So there are these massive differences in prices around the world. But what economists have done and statisticians have done is they've collected prices for nearly every country in the world, and these PPP adjusted incomes control or try to control as best we can for those price differences. So yes, if you're in rural Kenya, you make less in dollar terms, but everything's cheaper than if you live in California or Oslo. So what does two thousand dollars mean there? So the best we can adjust it, that two thousand dollars per capita income in Sub-Saharan Africa, is adjusted for U.S. prices. In other words, the typical resident of Sub-Saharan Africa, the typical citizen of Sub-Saharan Africa lives as if they were living here in Berkeley on $2,000 a year. That's average living standards. Now, that's shockingly low. 
That's a couple hundred dollars a month, maybe $150 a month. Seems impossible. But remember the story of the woman in Eritrea we just read. She is desperately poor. You, you'd be hard pressed to find many people living at that level of poverty in the US. There are some, but not very many. Okay, so think of those as living in the US on that amount of money. The typical Sub-Saharan African is living as if they were living in the US with $2,000 a year. The typical South Asian, $3,000 something a year. Even in East Asia with the you know, miraculous growth we've seen in China, say most of that average in East Asia is being driven by China, is only living at the equivalent of $6,000 something a year. And in the case of China, that's because even though there are glimmering cities on the coast, there's hundreds of millions of people living in the countryside who are really, really poor still. Latin America and Eastern Europe, Central Asia are richer. They're really in middle-income uh, territory. What other patterns jump out at you here? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So schooling levels have increased more in South Asia than they have in Sub-Saharan Africa. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, that's right. All these are pretty correlated. Africa's sort of at the bottom of all of them. And that's right. As you get richer, you get more schooling, you live longer, although it's not perfect. So, you know, for instance, people in Latin America live longer than people in Europe and Central Asia, 74 years to 71, even though they're poorer. Um, and, you know, part of that is there's been really disappointingly uh, low life expectancy in the former Soviet Union, Central Asia, since, since the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, there, was, there were drops in life expectancy in many Eastern Bloc countries. Okay. Now let's look at the other end of the distribution. Let's look at the richest 15 countries. And I'm just putting these up to put everything in perspective. Again, these are PPP adjusted incomes all the way on the right. You can see the US is at about $43,000 per year. The average American makes more than 20 times more than the average Sub Saharan African. Massive differences. And actually, all these countries are, are very rich. The highest income country here is Norway. That was um, you know, the reason, part of the reason for my example uh, before. Um, you know, other countries here, Australia. So there's basically Northern, um, North American countries, Canada, the US, Northern European countries, and a couple of Asian countries. The Asian countries that grew very rapidly uh, in the 20th century. Japan, um, Korea, Hong Kong are here. I, I don't know if they are allowed to show Taiwan for political reasons here, or else Taiwan would probably be on here too. Um, you know, the, the UN has you know, weird reporting about Taiwan because of the dispute with China. Um, but what do you see here? Life expectancies in the 80s almost everywhere. What's the exception to that? Of course, the US. We spend the most on health, and we have the worst health indicators. You know, it's because of our inefficient government run healthcare system. That must be the reason why. Sorry, couldn't help throw that in. Uh, we have the most private you know, healthcare system and the worst outcomes. OK, I won't make any more political comments. Um, uh, mean years of schooling here, double digits everywhere. Um, uh, expected years of schooling even higher. So going forward in all these rich countries, the expected years of schooling are just astronomical. So you know, the typical kid today is going to go to college in all these countries, basically. Get 17, 18 years of, of schooling. Much more than 4.7 years in Africa today. Any other things you see in this uh, figure? Anything else jump out at you? These are the bottom 22 countries in the world. And I want to point out a couple things. I put an arrow at income levels in Sierra Leone, in part because we're going to talk about Sierra Leone in this course. So it makes for a useful contrast with the US. Sierra Leone is about 50 times, well, 40 to 50 times, sorry, US average incomes are about 50 times larger than Sierra Leonean incomes. So Sierra Leone is poor even by African standards. And the typical Sierra Leonean is living on the equivalent of about $800 per year in US dollar terms living in the US. Just desperately uh, poor, if you can see uh, that number there. And you know, not coincidentally, Sierra Leone has one of the lowest life expectancies, 48 years. Which country? Which region of the world is overrepresented on this list? I think you know the answer to that question. Can you find which non-African countries are on this list at the bottom? So Afghanistan is the only country on this bottom 22 that's non-African. Out of the bottom 30, there's only three non-African countries. Afghanistan, Yemen, and Haiti. Those are the three. So basically, almost all the poorest countries in the world are in sub-Saharan Africa. That is where the world poverty is concentrated. There is a lot of poverty in India, in Bangladesh, in China as well. But it is nowhere as concentrated as it is in sub-Saharan Africa. Some of these numbers are just staggering. I put little stars by them. Again, I guess the font is a little bit too low. Average years of schooling among adults in Mozambique, 1.2 years. When we do work in Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone's a little bit better, three years. When we do work in Sierra Leone and we do surveys, we don't ask how many years of schooling people have typically. We just ask, have you been to school at all? Because only 20% of the adults in rural areas have set foot in a school for one day. So that's the distinction. Did you ever step foot in a school or not? At the same time that in the richest countries, people are getting 18 years of schooling on average. Just massive um, disparities. The poorest country here in terms of per capita income, and no one really knows how good this data is, is in Democratic Republic of Congo, $300 per year. Now, again, it's pretty hard to measure income. It's pretty hard to measure all these prices in different countries. So you probably shouldn't take these numbers literally. And you know, just to confirm the fact that these data may not be the best data, you can see the number for Afghanistan is exactly 1,000. What are the odds of that? Kind of feels like somebody kind of made that number up, and, and that's true for some of these for some of these numbers where we don't have data. Try getting really good household income data in parts of Afghanistan where there's a lot of conflict. It's hard. It's hard to collect data in the poorest countries in the world. So maybe not every number there in terms of income is exactly right, but the broad thrust is right. <coughs> the income levels are just much much lower. Okay. Any other thoughts on patterns in this data? Are there any outliers here? Are there any countries that are really poor in terms of income but really good in terms of education, or vice versa? Yeah. Zimbabwe. Okay. So that's a, that's an interesting one. Zimbabwe here has high years of schooling, and one of the lowest incomes. Does anybody know about the recent political history of Zimbabwe? There's hyperinflation. Um, a lot of uh, political disputes over land ownership, and a lot of political conflict and political repression as well. Zimbabwe, 20 years ago, was one of the richest countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So it had high schooling levels and also high income levels. Still has these pretty high schooling levels, but incomes have fallen uh, a lot. What other country cases sort of jump out at you here? Yeah. Yeah, so Burundi does, does really well. Oops, oh no. <laughs> this one I thought I figured out. Here we go. So Burundi has this incredible jump with big investments. Some other countries do as well. Rwanda is pretty similar. Rwanda, sort of in one generation, is going to go from three years of schooling to 11 years of schooling. The current trends continue. So some African countries, just in the last decade, have made really rapid progress in terms of education. Okay, so just two minutes left. Let me just show you a couple more maps, and we'll, we'll wrap up. This is the map I showed you before, the equal area map. This is a map where the size of each country represents population. 
And actually, it got cut off. Indonesia is here and Japan. Asia would look even bigger if they hadn't been cut off. So Asia looks really big here in terms of population. You've got China, India, um, you know, lots of very high population countries. There's some big African population countries here too. Nigeria, Ethiopia. And you know, again, the US and Canada are looking kind of smaller and smaller here. <laughs> Poor Canada. I mean, look at that. You know, when they had that like area, you know, the, the, the kind of Mercator map, they look huge. They're like nothing here. But this is what the world looks like in terms of GDP. Okay, so Asia, Asia's there, but Asia isn't that big a deal now compared to Europe, which is a really big deal. North America, the US is huge. And Africa has just disappeared. The only countries you can see really are South Africa. You can kind of make out Nigeria if you squint. That's Kenya. You can kind of make only South Africa kind of appears. So I think when we think about global economic inequality, the difference between this figure, which is population, and this figure kind of says it all. We're going to try to understand more about those pictures this, this term. Thanks.